Good. Well, good morning, everyone. Right. Of course, last week, uh, I was originally going to give part of this message. I've kind of changed it since, since last week. Uh, but before I actually get to the message, I want to kind of read. I was going through a bunch of old paperwork and, and a file and just throwing away a lot of stuff. That was old stuff I had. But while I was going through that, I found a, a prophetic word uh, that came from Bob Jones. This was dated February 11th, 2013. And those of you who might not know Bob Jones, he considered to be a, a prophet of the Lord. Uh, we were real familiar with him back in the early 80s. Uh, so he said it kind of up the, the new prophetic movement that was coming in at that time and incredible accuracy of, of things, even you know prophesying about an unknown comet coming and that came on his day or droughts starting on this date and then when it would rain and all those things. And so we, I, I thought this was really interesting because it says, again, this is two, uh, 2013 and the subtitle of, it, uh, of this prophetic word, it's a time to plead the blood of Jesus over all the viruses that are coming and the spirit of death. It said, in time, uh, it's time we get back to teaching about the blood and pleading the blood of Jesus over our lives, especially over the viruses that are coming. Now, these viruses can be taken out by the blood of Jesus. It's time we plead the blood over our houses because the enemy cannot enter it passed the blood. When the blood is on the lintels of the house, none of these death spirits can trespass. The death spirit passes over the house of all those who applied the blood to their doorposts on the night it came to kill all the firstborn in Egypt. And they went on to say, Recently I saw there were two plagues coming to the global nations, especially the United States. One plague was like influenza, while the other was like influenza, in nature, remember this severe illness, like influenza, is represented by the scorpion. Thus, the serpent has been killing through influenza, while the scorpion-like influenza results are severe illness, <clears throat> illness and could kill you. By plighting the blood of Jesus, we take authority over these plagues and cause them to die. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life unto death. So, you know, before this virus actually showed up last year, <clears throat> you know, that was not something that was even on my radar. You know, I was thinking of different things coming. I was thinking of earthquakes. I was thinking of volcanoes. And I think <clears throat> as we're entering this time of, of the very beginning of the times of a uh, not tribulation, but a time of birth pangs that are coming. But it, that was not something that was really on my, my radar. And then to go back and read this in, in 2013, that he was saying, yes, these are coming. Uh, and the importance of pleading the blood of Jesus over ourselves and over our family. That's critical important, and that, uh, And according to that word, there are other things yet coming our way, other viruses. All right, so this morning, do we have an overhead up there? Maybe we don't. Okay, anyway, today's topic is, uh, is on persecution. Uh, I was actually going to do this again last week, of course, on Valentine's Day, and my lovely bride said, well, you think that's a, a great topic for Valentine's Day to talk about persecution? <clears throat> I said, well, yes, it is, because St. Valentine, he was, he was tortured and he was martyred, and actually he was uh, killed by the Emperor Claudius uh, on February 14th, the year 269. <clears throat> and he, he did several miracles, and uh, he also ministered to the persecution, persecuted church at that time. And I, you know, just looking at some of the church history, it says it wasn't really until about the 4th century before the church really began to talk a lot about the cross. And that was because they were dealing with it. They were living it every day. It was just part of their life. So there was no need to talk about it. They were in that place of, of being persecuted. I had a, 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 oh yes, a picture. There it is. Okay. 
You know, if I was to ask everybody here, okay, who, who's the quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs? I bet not a single person in here would miss that. Sierra, raise your hand. So I can point you out. I don't think so. Now, does anybody know the name of these guys? There's 21 people, 21 men, and this was in 2015, 21 Coptic Christians that uh, ISIS had brought to this beach, and they're about to be de beheaded. And they were all given a chance to deny the Lord and accept Islam, and they would, their lives would have been spared. Not one of them did. And yet, do any of us know even one of their names? And I don't know any of their names either. So I'm not pointing on you guys. I'm just saying, look how we pick our heroes. And men like this who face death and would not deny the Lord. Today, they say that, that one in ten Christians, which is about 200 million, are being uh, persecuted or discriminated against throughout the world. Now, in our nation, we've never known that. We don't know really what it's like. We, we don't have a clue. We think we're persecuted. Somebody makes fun of us. But we're going to find out what it's like. There's a quote from a, a Leonard Sweet. He's an author, pastor, theologian. And he says, The gospel has always gone against the grain, but the grain has been friendly grain until now. From here on out, it is hostile grain. And I think that's so true. We've always, as Christians, are going against the current culture. You know, it's, a, it's like a, a stream. A current that's going and, and we're always swimming against that but especially now it's going to become hostile where there's actually hostility towards Christians and towards Christians beliefs about oh, I think it's been two weeks ago Glenn and I watched the movie it was called uh, a hidden life and it was a true story of an Austrian man and his family uh, this was doing uh, the 1940s doing World War II, and, and it's a, a movie that's it's kind of long, but it's, it's worth watching. It's, it's very little dialogue, but beautiful scenery because it's in Austria and the mountains and all that, and, and it, de it depicts uh, this man with his family. He's got a couple daughters and his wife and, and just them together and how they're enjoying life and joining each other and all that goes on, and, and at the same time, he's many times it shows him the pictures going to going to church, and he's really in deep prayer because their fear is that he was going to be drafted into the German army. So every time the telegram guy on his little bicycle would come to the village, they, you know, it was like, you know, is this it? And, and eventually, it is. He comes, delivers that telegram that he's been drafted. And to make a long story short, he's taken to the induction center, and how they all line up. And, you know, raise their hand, and they swear uh, allegiance to, to Hitler. Uh, he refuses to do that. He just keeps his arm down. Of course, he immediately stands out, and they come grab him and, and take him into straight to prison. He's tortured and beaten and trying to get him to change his mind and, and to take the oath. He won't do it. Uh, eventually, he goes to trial, and they find him guilty because he won't change, and uh, he's given a death sentence, and then uh, one of the most poignant points of the movie is where his wife and then his uh, pastor or priest from their little village are able to come see him before uh, his execution. And as they're meeting there, there's a little table, and he's sitting there, and the, the priest comes up and, and tells him, you know, quietly says, just say the words. What you say is not what's in your heart. Just say the words. He wouldn't do it. They said, think of your wife. Think of your two little girls. And he would not do it. And later, basically it ends, kind of a, not necessarily a happy movie, but at the end he's actually, you know, there's a guillotine and they have a whole bunch of people and, and he's killed. But he stood by his, his faith. He stood uh, strong and would not 
in the midst of that. You know, and that was so hard when I thought, think of your wife, think of your, your two girls. And so it makes you think, okay, what would you do? If you're, if you're in that situation, what would you do faced with death? I think of many heroes throughout that time, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great theologian and pastor and writer who, uh, you know, stood against Hitler and then right at the close of World War II, he was executed. One of my favorite quotes is from a, a missionary by the name of Jim Elliott. Uh, Jim Elliott was a, a missionary, and he was actually ministering to the Aka Indians in Ecuador, uh, an unreached people group, a wild tribe. And uh, as he was, flew his plane, landed on the beach, and was trying to share the gospel, he was killed, speared to death. And it's interesting that later, the guy who killed him later became a Christian. In fact, I think most of that tribe eventually became Christians through his death. But he had a quote, and I think it's a, a, one of the most powerful quotes I know. And he said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So let that soak in. Think about that. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So as we begin to move in this, in this new time of, of, of a change, of, of, of possible persecution coming, and there's some terms you may want to be familiar with. Which one is soft totalitarianism, which basically means that what we're experiencing right now, hard totalitarianism is basically, you know, a nation conquers one nation, they set the government in, and this is the way it is. Soft comes in softly, comes in by, by slowly, uh, what we're seeing now, again, with the council culture, they begin to silence any uh, dissent from the public or from the government line. Uh, and, and then that develops into harder and a harder persecution of shutting down any dissent. And already we're seeing that several places. You know, in uh, Great Britain, like a Catholic school, they can only have 50% of their students are Catholic. The rest have to be either uh, Muslims or they have to be uh, atheists. They have to be something else besides Catholics, even though it's a private school. I just read recently that in Germany, uh, a pastor was uh, arrested and then has been fined a great uh, lot of money because he taught biblical sexuality. And that was considered, and I think that's what's coming near us, in the future, will be considered hate speech. And yet we must stand for what the Bible states. So how does that unfold? Well, you know, I don't know how fast it is and what it's going to look like. I think one thing will be eventually, some of the pressure will be uh, doing away with your uh, nonprofit status, your tax exemption, things like that. And then it will get more serious where it can actually be where they will shut you down, or they will put you in jail, find you. Does that mean it's, it's in concrete that this is going to happen? I think the only, our only out is for revival for the church across the nation and a third great awakening to come to this nation. God's had mercy on this nation before with two great awakenings that turned the nation back from where it was going back to the godly foundations. And so that's what we need to pray and believe God for, revival in his own people, and then a great awakening to sweep across this nation. Now, I had a, a bunch of verses I was going to go through, uh, and I kind of changed, like say, a little bit because I kind of had a little different take on some of this. So I'm just going to uh, give you the address. You can look it up later. Uh, some of these are familiar stories, but... Daniel chapter 3 uh, is a story of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three Hebrew youths who uh, refuse, as you know, King Nebuchadnezzar builds a golden statue, and everybody is told to bow down and, and worship this statue. They refuse to do it, and then uh, they're brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar asks them, and they say, no, we won't do that. 
And uh, they say, say, well, our God is able to deliver us, but if he does not, we will not worship the golden nut. And, of course, we know what happened. They, they throw him. They, they actually, he turns the furnace up seven, or, you know, seven times hotter than normal. Uh, even the soldiers who threw him into the furnace were killed because of the heat, and they're just walking around, you know, in the midst of the furnace. So they were delivered that time, and shortly after that, uh, in Matthew 6, we have the story of Daniel, of course, in the lion's den, similar situation. Uh, they were told not to pray to anybody for 30 days, and Daniel goes on with his normal prayer time, three times a, a, a day of praying to the Lord. And uh, he's caught in that, and so they're going to throw him in the lion's den, and he's not going to stop, and basically, again, he is delivered. But whether they're delivered or whether they're not, the thing is that they're refused to go along. You know, Matthew 10, uh, Jesus says in verse 22, says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Fear him who not only when he kills the body, but can kill the soul and put in hell. That's who you are to fear. Of course, Matthew 16 he talks about the cost of discipleship. He says he must deny himself. He who would follow him or be a disciple must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In other words, there is a cost of discipleship. Now, there's some scriptures I want to look up. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 18 and 20. So this is where, just to catch up to that point, is where <clears throat> Peter and John have been arrested uh, by the Sanhedrin. They're brought forward, they're told, you know, uh, told, okay, well, do not preach in this guy in Jesus' name anymore. Do not be preaching, teaching. And it comes to verse 18, and they say, Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourself whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. But we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. So judge for yourself whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. So there may come a day when we face that dilemma and decision. And I think us as a church will make that. We will not compromise. We'll stand by what the word says. Despite what the state may say or what the federal government may say. We will stand by the word of God. But there are going to be a lot of churches who won't, who will compromise because they don't want to suffer loss. And so it will be a dividing line between churches. Revelations chapter 12 and verse 11 A verse that I've already read that Bob Jones had, had uh, used. It says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimonies. They did not love their life so much as to shrink from death. Those are questions you've already, you know, those are, are verses that you have to question yourself. Again, you have to. Put yourself, so often we read scripture and we just read it, and it's so much better if you put yourself in the middle of that, and you ask yourself hard questions. What would I do? Where do I stand? And while you're in Revelation, Revelation chapter 21, in verse 6 through 8, said he said to me it is done I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end 
To him who is thirsty, I will give drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all of this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. In verse 8, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexual immoral, those who practice magical arts, the idolaters, all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. What always caught my attention throughout for many years was that the first thing he lists in verse 8 of all those different things we're familiar with sins is, but the cowardly is the first thing. I think every version that I've looked at had that listed the first thing. Which brought me back to Matthew chapter 10. And the words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. And Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says, Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. So I was at that place of, of all those examples I just gave and, and thinking about that, but it also brought me to another place, another situation, another very familiar place in the Bible of, of a failure of someone who denied the Lord and how that all fits. So I was kind of conflicted and, and asking a lot of questions of myself. And if I'm conflicted, and asking questions to myself, I want you to be conflicted and asking questions of yourself. Now, in a normal church, you don't do that. You've got, you got a direction you're going, and you've got your three points, and you go. But we're not a normal church. So, so let's go, and, and let's look at that. It's in Matthew also, Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, and we're going to start with verse 31. So this is when they're in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before Jesus is to be arrested. And verse 31 says, Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I rise, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Now Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the disciples said the same thing. Now in the NIV it uses disown, uh, ES, deny, same, same difference. But Peter says, even if all the rest of the knuckleheads fall away, I will never fall away. Like he's saying, remember, Lord, you told me I'm the rock. I am the rock. These other guys may desert you, not me. Of course, all that says all the other disciples are saying the same thing. They were, you know, chest bumping each other. Yeah, you know, yeah, what's that about? What we're going to do. So they're, they're pretty confident in where they're at, what they're going to do. So let's look over to verse 69, same chapter. We'll see how this turns out. So this is after Jesus is arrested. And verse 69 says, Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and the servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. 
But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you are talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed, and then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. So just a few hours after he made the boast, can you imagine the, the shame and the guilt that Peter had to, had to feel of failing the Lord after just confessing that he would never do that? And yet when it come, push came to serve, he denied, disowned the Lord. He was the one who was supposed to be the rock. But we don't leave the story there. So we go to John chapter 21, Gospel of John. And one of the other Gospels that talks about how, you know, when the rooster crowed, it says that Jesus looked at him Gave him eye contact at that moment. So in, in chapter 21, this is after Jesus has uh, risen from the dead. They have seen him alive. And uh, Peter, start in verse 15, but... He had, uh, well, let's go, actually go back. Um, at the beginning of chapter 21, Peter says uh, in verse 3, I'm going out to fish. Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. So what's really happening here is uh, even though Peter and the disciples have seen that Jesus has risen from the dead, his failure, his denying the Lord three times, his shame, his guilt, he, he was feeling there was no place for him now. So what was he going to do? I'm going back to what I know. I was a fisherman. That's how I made my living. I'm going back. I'm going to fish. I'm going back to my old life. And then the Lord shows up. And again, which has kind of happened at the beginning, when they first met, you know, he tells them to throw the net on the other side. They catch it. They were fishing all night, caught nothing. The net's, you know, 153 large fish. They bring in. And I want to pick up the story in, in, in verse 15. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. Now the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know all that I love you. Jesus said, 
feed my sheep. So for each of those three times that, that Peter denied the Lord, he tests him and he asks him, Lord, Peter, do you love me? And of course, the third time, he's, he's like grieved. Yes, I love you. I failed you, but I love you. And so what the Lord is doing there, he's reinstating Peter. You know, you still have a future. You have a future with me. And then he goes on and says in verse 18, I tell you the truth, and Jesus is speaking to Peter, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. Now, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. So Jesus tells him, this is what the future holds. Eventually, when you're older, your arms are going to be stretched out, which means basically the time of, type of death, he was going to be crucified. And what church history tells us that, that Peter asked when they were crucified him, to cru be crucified upside down because he did not feel worthy uh, to be crucified in the same manner as the Lord. And so the first part is really good news. He's being reinstated. He has a future with the Lord. But at the same time, oh, really? you got to tell me that, that I'm going to be crucified eventually. It's kind of like, you know, when, when uh, Paul after he was blinded, he's in Damascus, and then and Ananias comes to him and he tells Ananias, because I must show him how much he must suffer. He really didn't tell him how awesome of a, of a, of a ministry he's going to have. He said, I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my sake. And because minister, or, you know, misery loves company, then Peter goes, verse 20, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. In other words, John was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said to him, Lord, who is going to betray you? Now, when Peter saw him, he asked the Lord, well, what about him? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. And because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that, the, that that disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Now, this is the disciple who testifies these things and who wrote them down. We know that this testimony is true. And Jesus did many other things well. If every one of them was written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that were written. But when he asked about John, well, what about John? And he says, what is that to you? And I think sometimes we get in that same place where we think, well, what about so-and-so? You know, how, you know, Maybe it's on the opposite end where they're they're getting blessed and they have a great ministry and go, Lord, and he goes back, you follow me. We each have a, a our own calling, our own gifting, our own place that the Lord wants to use us and how he wants to use us. And it's not our business who else he tries to use or how he uses them. That our whole thing is we must follow him. We must follow the lamb of God. So there are some things that are coming our way. Again, I, I just think that where we are as a nation, we're in a place where we're going to start seeing something we've never seen again in, in, in our nation that the church has never experienced before, and that is persecution. And when persecution comes, it separates. Because some people are going to say, when it begins to cost them something, they're going to walk away. But one thing persecution does, it separates and brings the true church, those who are truly his, together. 
and there'll be a fence. You know, many times I think there's a lot of Christians who are like, they're on the fence. They've got one side, one foot in the, in the world. They've got one, one foot in the kingdom of God. And you're not going to be able to be, you're not going to be able to straddle that fence anymore. It's going to be, you're either going to be wholeheartedly the Lord's no matter what the cost is, or you're done. You're, you're going to choose. You're going to make a choice. But at the same time, we've got to remember, despite what may be coming, despite the, the persecution, you know, in, in Matthew chapter 5, you know, the Lord said, blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who persecuted. So sometimes we have to reorient our thinking and realize that, hey, we're getting persecuted Blessed are we. And he will give us the grace. He will give us the strength. He will prepare us. He will give us everything we need. He says he's given us everything we need for godliness. So we don't need to fear the things that are coming. We just need to, to be, make sure our feet are planted firmly. And that we're not going to be moved by persecution, by what may happen, but we're going to stay faithful to the Lord. And just know that he's going to bless us. He'll make a way where there seems to be no way if we will just be faithful. And what that looks like, we don't yet know. But I know across the world, many places, again, in China, is really cracking down now upon the church. Where they've had, had some freedoms in the past. Uh, for most of them, they're going to have to be com go completely underground again. Because there's going to be stronger persecution now. And now with the technology, like in China, that's why they, they have that social credit score. So they can track you. They know where you are, know what you're doing. There's facial recognition on all the phones. And if you do anything that's out of line of the government policy, then, again, you don't have a job. Your kids don't go to school. They, they just cut down, silence you. And we need to be praying for them. And unfortunately, we might think it's unfortunate, but the Chinese church is actually praying for us for persecution. You go, sometimes I go, well, thanks. I thank, <laughs> you know. But, uh, but again, it's worth it. It's, it's you know, it's, it's a purifying of the church. You know, God's coming back for a pure and spotless bride. And that's part of the process. The fire purifies. And so we don't need to fear it. We just need to prepare ourselves, be ready, be mentally, emotionally, spiritually prepared. And at the same time, again, that's, it's during those times when the gospel goes forth and where a great harvest of souls comes into the kingdom. So our, our thoughts need to be more upon God's kingdom rather than our own comfort. I think the Lord's more concerned with my heart than he is my, my comfort. Sometimes I'm real concerned about my comfort, but <clears throat> he's not so concerned. He wants to do a work. He wants to be that purifying fire. He wants to prepare us for whatever it is that is coming and to strengthen us and to be a voice of righteousness and truth in the midst of a very dark time. And I don't know what the next is. You know, I, I was taken to my... Uh, Got a couple cousins, you know, and actually son too, lives in Texas, but they were talking about, she was telling me about how they had to go without power for three days, and, and the only food they had was a jar of peanut butter and some crackers for three days. And I thought, wow, it varied a little bit. Maybe instead of having peanut butter and crackers, you could have crackers and peanut butter. But, you know, so got kind of old and half, but, but it made me think like, you know, I was telling you, you guys need to be, prepared because if more storms are coming and i don't mean necessarily weather storms there's storms coming you know this is the new this is the new way of life as a, you know as we enter those times of birth pains again birth pains start out uh not very painful mild there's a long time between them as time goes on those those lengths between the birth pains get shorter and shorter and they get a lot more intense so we're just at the very beginning of these things beginning to unfold. 
But you ought to be excited because God knew that you would be alive at this time in human history, and he has a purpose and a calling for each one of us. And it's going to be a glorious time. Well, let's go ahead and stand and pray. So, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that you are preparing a pure and spotless bride. And, Lord, we welcome again your dealings with us. We welcome your purifying fire. Lord, we ask that you would help gird us up, Lord, that you would uh, grant us, Lord, a renewed mind by the washing of your word. Lord, that we would truly be sold out to you. That, Lord, just as... Uh, this is Jim Elliot. Lord made that, that quote. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Let us see from eternity's viewpoint. Lord, we are, as flesh, we are so short-term, earthly-minded that, Lord, it's hard for us to wrap our, our minds. But, Lord, open our minds, open our hearts, open our spirits. Lord, we pray, Lord, for an open heavens above this place. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would send angelic help. We ask, Lord, that you would increase your anointing upon each one of us, Lord, as a body. That you would increase the gifts of the Spirit. Lord, that you would minister to your people. That you would build your people up. That you would prepare your people for the glorious days. Lord, as Isaiah 60 says, when great and gross darkness covers the earth, rise and shine. So, Lord, we want to rise and we want to shine. We want to be those lights in the midst of darkness. So, Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. We welcome it, Lord. We just want to line ourselves up with you, your kingdom, and your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen.